In this lecture, we're going to complete our exploration of chapter 10, which is titled Work and Wealth. And in particular, we're going to finish off with sections 10.5 and 10.6. Section 10.5 is titled The Digital Divide. And what is the concept of the digital divide? Well, the digital divide refers to the situation in which some people have access to modern information technology while others simply do not. The underlying assumption motivating the term is that people who use cell phones, computers, and the internet have opportunities denied to people without access to these information technology devices. And the idea of a digital divide became popular in the mid-1990s with the rapid growth and popularity of the World Wide Web. According to Pippa Norris, the digital divide has two fundamentally different dimensions. First, the global divide, and second, the social divide. The global divide refers to the disparity in Internet access between more industrialized and less industrialized nations. That's the global divide. But the social divide refers to the difference in access between the rich and the poor within a particular country. And so what's the evidence that there is a digital divide? Well, in other words, what is hampering Internet development in less techn technologically developed countries? Well, the first thing is that there is often there is little wealth because in many of these less technic technologically developed countries, um, there's not simply not enough money to provide everyone in the country with the necessities of life, much less pay for internet connections. And second, many of these countries have inadequate telecommunications infrastructure. For example, less than 25% of the people in the following countries have cell phones. North Korea, Cuba, Somalia, South Sudan, Ethiopia, and others. Many poor people have no access to newspapers, radio, or television. And third, the primary language is not English. English is the dominant language for business and scientific development, giving English-speaking countries a comparative advantage with respect to competing in the global marketplace, but not in other countries that are less technologically developed. Uh, and fourth, literacy is low and education is inadequate. Half the population in poorer countries has no opportunity to attend secondary schools. And there is str a strong correlation between literacy and wealth, both for individuals and for societies. Fifth, the country's culture may not make participating in the informa information age a priority. So even within wealthy countries such as the United States, the extent to which people use the internet varies significantly according to demographics like age, wealth, and educational achievement. The Pew Internet polled Americans to find out how many made use of the internet as of early 2018. And they found that online access varied from 98% of 18 to 29 year olds to 66% of those 65 and older. Fully 98% of adults living in households with annual incomes of at least $75,000 a year use the internet compared to 81% of adults living in households with annual incomes less than $30,000. While 97% of those with a college degree use the internet, only 65% of those who dropped out of high school went online. The report also noted that the less connected groups are gradually catching up with the more connected groups. And so there are two models for technological diffusion. Um, the first some background information to, to understand what's being uh, graphed here. So new technologies are usually expensive and so the first people to adopt new technologies are those who are better off in terms of their wealth. And as the technology matures, its price drops dramatically, enabling more people to acquire it. And then eventually, 
the price of the technology gets low enough that it becomes available to nearly everyone. And so the rate at which this technology gets assimilated is, is known as its the technological diffusion. It refers to the rate at which a new technology is assimilated into a society. And two different theories predict how a new technology is acquired by people in a society based on their socioeconomic status. You can see the two uh, different theories in terms of graphs here. So we start off, no matter which graph we're looking at, dividing society into three groups. And so we'll say people with the highest socioeconomic status are in group A. People with the lowest socioeconomic status are in group C. And group B consists of those people in the middle. So in the normal normalization model, which is the or graph A, group A begins to adopt the technology first, followed by group B, and finally group C. However, at some point, nearly everyone in all three groups is using the new technology. Um, in the stratification model, or graph B, the order of adoption is the same as in the normalization model. However, in this model, the eventual num number of people in group C who adopt the technology is well, significantly lower than the number of adopters in group A. And then the percentage of people in group B who adopt the technology is somewhere between the levels of groups of group A and group B. Or sorry, of group A and group C. All right, and you can have different attitudes toward technological um, diffusion. You can be a technological optimist or a pessimist. Uh, those are common containers at least to group people in. So technological optimists believe the global adoption of information technology will follow the normalization model. Right, information, on their view, information technology will make the world a better place by reducing poverty in developing countries and creating opportunities elsewhere will reduce the number of people tr trying to immigrate into the United States. Technological pessimists, on the other hand, believe that information technology adoption will follow the stratification model, leading to a permanent condition of haves and have-nots. Information technology, on their view, will only exacerbate existing inequalities between rich and poor nations and between rich and poor people within each nation. And technological pessimists point out that the gap between the richest 20 countries and the poorest 20 countries continues to grow. In the, 1960, in the 1960s, the average gross domestic product, or GDP, of the richest countries was 18 times larger than the average GDP of the poorest countries. And then by 1995, the gap had grown to 37 times greater. Some of the poorest countries grew even poorer during the last third of the 20th century. So let's look at some critiques of the concept of the digital divide. So Mark Warshower has suggested three reasons why the term digital divide is not helpful. First, it tends to promote the idea that the difference between the haves and the have-nots is simply a question of access. Some politicians have jumped to the conclusion that providing technology will close the divide, but Warshower says this approach will not work. For IT to make a difference, social systems must change as well, and the introduction of information technology must take into account local culture, which includes language, literacy, and community values. Warshower's second criticism of the term digital divide is that it implies everyone is on one side or another of a huge canyon. Right, everybody is put into one of two categories, as we've already heard, the haves and the have-nots. But in reality, access is a continuum and each individual occup occupies a particular place on it. For example, how would you categorize someone in these two containers who has a 56k modem connecting his PC to the internet? So certainly that person has online access, but 
he is not able to retrieve the same wealth of material as someone with a broadband connection. Third, Warshower says that the term digital divide implies that a lack of access will lead to a less advantaged position in society. But is that the proper direction or order of causality? Because models of technological diffusion show that those with a less advantaged position in society tend to adopt new technologies at a later time, which is an argument that the causality actually goes the other way. So, but in reality, there is no simple uh, direction of causality this way or that. Each factor affects the other. And then finally, Warshower points out that the internet does not represent the pinnacle of information technology. Uh, in the next few decades, dramatic new technologies will be created, and we will see these new technologies being adopted at different speeds too. Okay, let's talk about massive open online courses. For the past several decades, the rate of tuition increases at universities and colleges in the United States has exceeded the inflation rate, making a college education increasingly difficult for students from poorer families to afford. So uh, an alternative has cropped up called Free Massive Open Online Courses, or MOOCs, and these are often promoted as a way to mark or to make higher education more affordable, which would help all students, but particularly those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. In 2012, Colorado State University Global became the first university in the United States to grant credit to students completing a particular MOOC in computer science, and other universities are likely to follow. And you might wonder, is solving the problem of ever more expensive higher education as simple as simply providing access to online courses, free access? And the Community College Research Center conducted a study of online education at two statewide community colleges, one in the southern United States and the other in the western United States. And their study revealed that students who take online courses are less likely to complete and perform well in them compared with students who take the same courses in a traditional classroom setting. The study also showed that the online experience widened the achievement gap between white and black students and between those with higher GPAs and those with lower GPAs. Let's say something about net neutrality. So in the middle of the last decade, corporations that operate the long distance internet backbone connections in the United States suggested that they might begin tiered service, which means charging more for higher priority routing of internet packets. And these companies said that tiered service would be needed in the future to guarantee a satisfactory level of service to companies that require it, such as voice over internet protocol providers. And content providers such as Google and Yahoo joined forces with the American Library Association and consumer groups to oppose any notion of tiered service. Instead, these groups asked the US Congress to enact net neutrality legislation that would require internet service providers to treat all packets the same. And consumer groups suggested that if tiered service were enacted, only large corporations would be able to pay for the highest level of service. And small startup companies wouldn't be able to compete with established corporate giants. And so the argument concluded that tiered service would discourage innovation and competition. Now, another argument against tiered service was based on the concern that companies controlling the internet might block or degrade access to non-favored content or applications. For example, a customer with an AT&T Yahoo DSL connection might find that high definition video content from AT&T channels performs better than high definition video from other providers. And net neutrality advocates said that this would be unfair and should be prevented, pointing out that 95% of customers have only two choices for broadband access 
the local, either the local cable company or the local telephone company. Opponents of net neutrality legislation suggested that allowing people to pay more to get a higher quality of service can benefit customers. For example, rapid delivery of data packets would be more valuable to a person using the internet for video conferencing than a person who simply sends email messages. Internet backbone providers argued that even though there was currently enough bandwidth, the rapidly increasing popularity of YouTube and other online video sites would soon fill the internet's data pipes, and a significant amount of money would be needed to upgrade the internet infrastructure to support the higher bandwidth applications of the future. And so this money ought to come from the companies like Netflix that sell access to data intensive content. In February of 2015, the, during the administration of President Barack Obama, the Federal Communications Commission issued the Open Internet Order to preserve net neutrality. It prohibited telecommunications companies from engaging in three activities, namely blocking content, throttling back the speed of transmissions, and providing a higher speed of service to people or businesses that pay more. And the FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler said, quote, no one, whether government or corporate, should control free open access to the Internet, end quote. The FCC grounded its authority to make these rules on Title II of the Telecommunications Act, in effect deciding that the Internet should be regulated as a public utility. Under the administration of President Donald Trump, the FCC changed course, and in December of 2017, the commissioners voted to repeal the net neutrality rules put in place by the Obama administration. And the re repeal took effect in June 2018. Responding to the FCC's decision, lawmakers in dozens of states introduced legislation to preserve net neutrality rules. And in March of 2018, the state of Washington became the first state to preserve for its residents the net neutrality rules established by the FCC in 2015. Okay, in the final section, section 10.6, is titled The Winner-Take-All Society. The Declaration of Independence states that, quote, all men are created equal, end quote, but we live in a society in which some people have far more wealth and power than others. So uh, an interesting question that arises is, what if everyone were guaranteed roughly the same amount of income? And the traditional answer to this question is that there would be little motivation for people to exert themselves, either mentally or physically. And the logic continues, if everyone were paid the same, there would be no point in getting an education, taking risks, or working hard. And productivity would be low, and the overall standard of living would be poor. For this reason, many people believe a superior alternative is a market economy that rewards innovation, hard work, and risk-taking by compensating people according to the value of the goods they produce. In the winner-take-all society, economists Robert Frank and Philip Cook explore the growth of markets in which a few top performers receive a disproportionate share of the rewards, and their book is the primary source for this section. Frank and Cook observed that the winner-take-all phenomenon has existed for quite a while in the realms of sports, entertainment, and the arts. For example, a few superstar athletes, actors, and novelists earn millions from their work and garner lucrative endorsements, while those who perform at a slightly lower level make far less. However, the winner-take-all phenomenon has now spread throughout our global economy. Sometimes the qualitative difference between the top product and the second best product is very slight, yet that can be the difference between success and failure. Hence, corporations compete for the top executive talent that can give them the edge over their competition. And as a result, the comp compensation of CEOs at America's largest corporations has risen much faster than the wages of production workers. And in Here's this uh, image of these $100 bills makes the point visually, but it, what it's 
meant to be interpreted as saying, showing is that in 1980, the average pay for a CEO at a large American company was about 40 times the pay of a production worker. And so the stack of $100 bills for the CEO is about 40 times larger than the stack for the worker and from under the 19 or above the 1980 number or year. And by 2003, the ratio had risen to about 400 to one. And there you can see the ratio aspect of 400 to one. And several factors have influenced the winner take all phenomenon in our economy. First, information technology and efficient transportation systems make it easier for a leading product to dominate the worldwide market. For example, consider a music studio that has a digital recording of the world's best orchestra playing Beethoven's Symphony No. 5 in C minor. The studio can produce millions of perfect copies of this recording, enough for every classical musical love, classic music lover, classical music lover on the planet. So why would anyone want to listen to the second best orchestra when a CD of the best orchestra is available for virtually the same price? Second, network economies encourage people to flock to the same product. So if by chance you should need to use someone else's computer, it is far more likely that person will own a Windows PC uh, compared to a Macintosh. And in this respect, knowing how to use a Windows computer has greater utility than knowing how to use a Macintosh. And if a person cannot decide which computer to purchase, this factor alone may encourage someone to buy a Windows PC rather than a Macintosh. Third, English has become the de facto language of international business. So English is the native language in 12 countries, including the United States, which is the dominant economic power on the planet. But another 56 countries teach English in their schools, and the dominance of English makes it easier for products to find a worldwide market. And fourth, business norms have changed. In the past, large businesses promoted from within and would not recruit executives from other firms, but today, firms vigorously compete with each other for top executive talent. Frank and Cook argue, though, that winner-take-all effects are bad for the economy for a variety of reasons. First, winner-take-all markets increase the gap between the rich and the poor. Between 1979 and 1989, the inflation-adjusted incomes of the top 1% of U.S. wage earners doubled, while the median income was flat and the average income of the bottom 20% actually declined. And winner-take-all effects draw some of the most talented people into socially unproductive work. Uh, the, so the problem with winner-take-all, or this problem with winner-take-all contests, is that they attract too many contestants. For example, for every comedian who hosts a late-night talk show, tens of thousands of comedians struggle in nightclubs, hoping for their big break. The multi-million dollar incomes of a relatively few high-profile high attorneys help attract many of the brightest college students toward law school, and then we end up with too many lawyers. Meanwhile, there's a shortage of nurse, nurses and nuclear engineers. Winner-take-all markets also problematically create wasteful investment and consumption. For example, there is fierce competition among candidates for slots in the top business and law schools. No one wants to go for an interview looking less than his or her best, and for this reason male interviewees are reluctant to show up for an interview wearing a suit that costs less than $600. But if everyone is wearing a $600 suit, no one has an advantage over the others due to his attire. Instead, if they had all spent $300 on their suits, there would have been the same relative equity. Um, and the behavior of business school applications is similar to this sort of arms race. The desire to seek an advantage leads to an escalation of consumption, even if the eventual result is simply parity. And in particular, a, a disproportionate share of the best and brightest college students become concentrated in a few elite institutions. Uh, Frank and Cook write, quote, 
the day has already arrived when failure to have an elite undergraduate degree closes certain doors completely, no matter what other stellar credentials a student might possess." End quote. Many Wall Street firms will not even interview candidates who did not graduate from one of a very small number of top law schools. These law schools show a preference for graduates of elite undergraduate programs, uh, hence high school students interested in reaching the top of the legal profession know that their best chance is to do their undergraduate work at an elite school. The result is a tremendous competition for a relatively small number of openings at these colleges, while in truth there are hundreds of top quality public and private colleges and universities in the United States. And winner-take-all markets also harm our culture, and here's why. People are social, they like to read the same books and see the same movies as their friends. Uh, even introverted individuals or people low in extroversion uh, report increases in happiness when they act like they're extroverted. So, and the reason people like to have these things in common, like the same books and the same movies, is it gives them something to talk about. So suppose two books have about the same appeal to a customer, but one of them is on a bestseller list. Well, in that case, the consumer is more likely to select the book on the bestseller list because it increases the probability that she will encounter a friend who has read it as well. But that means it's really important for a, a book publisher to get its books on the bestseller list. And publishers know that books written by uh, known, well-known authors have a greater chance of making the bestseller list than books written by new authors. And so this knowledge can lead a publisher to give a big advance to a well-known author to produce a second-rate work rather than invest the same resources in developing an unknown but more talented author. And the same effect happens with movie producers. Hoping for the largest possible sales on the first weekend, they bankroll second-rate sequels to big hits rather than original stories filmed by lesser-known directors. And winner-take-all is not fair because it gives much greater rewards to the top performers when those other performers who are much paid much less are actually only slightly inferior, relatively speaking, to the remuneration that, that the top performers receive. So here's just an example. There are several, but this is from the world of professional sports, uh, professional golf in particular, where winnings and performance data are objective and publicly available. So uh, here are the names of some male PGA players, Dustin Johnson, Justin Rosen, Miguel Angel Carballo. Their skill levels are very close, as you can see from table 10.3 here on the slide, but their earnings vary dramatically during the 2016 to 2017 season. Johnson, who ranked number one in earnings per tournament, brought home an average of $436,610 for every tournament he entered. Rose was number nine in this category and earned an average of $235,850 every time he entered a tournament, while Miguel at Num ranked at number three, 303, earned only $8,483. $8, so if winner-take-all markets have harmful consequences on our economy and society, what can be done? Well, Frank and Cook suggest four ways to reduce winner-take-all effects. First, societies can enact laws limiting the number of hours that stores remain open for business. These laws ensure parity among competing businesses and prevent them from engaging in positional arms races. But without these laws, one business may extend its hours in order to gain an advantage over its competitors. And soon all of its competitors follow suit and parity is restored. But now all the employees must bear the burden of the longer hours. So regulations on business hours are often called blue laws. And then second, in the absence of laws, businesses can form cooperative agreements to reduce 
positional arms races. And an example is when a group of professional sports team owners agrees to establish a cap on team salaries. Third, more progressive tax structures reduce excess competition for the few handsomely rewarded positions. Back in 1961, the marginal tax rate on income in the highest tax bracket was 91%. By 1989, the highest marginal income tax rate had been lowered to 28%. Consumption taxes and luxury taxes are other ways of targeting the wealthiest people. Heavily taxing those with the highest incomes makes a higher income less attractive and dissuades some people from competing for the highest paying jobs. And society benefits when these people engage in more productive work anyway. And then finally, campaign finance reform can reduce the political power of the wealthiest 1% of the population who control more than one third of the wealth. So reducing the political power of the very wealthy is a, another way to reduce the attraction of competing for the highest paying positions.